and and um, and I said, you know, we're because the entire process involves so much water, right? I mean, we we'll call the entire process aside from the washing. The tahara is itself about the water. It's all about the water. So, um, I, when asked, you know, what 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 more could we do? I thought it would be a good idea to talk about water altogether, since you're uh, working with it. Now, talking about water altogether, not specific to the process of tahara, right? Because um, we want to have a better understanding about like what water is. Why should the why should water be the um, the uh, the agent? So I'm going to start off with a certain principle, which I think has come up before in the past. You know, if you've been here in earlier sessions, which is that. We don't have, um, the, in, in our Jewish worldview, we don't have a concept of things being symbolic. Symbols, we don't, we don't do things symbolically. And, and although you might have heard many times people use a language of this is a symbol, you know, this is symbolic in, in all different kinds of areas of halakha and, um, and, and Jewish practice as if we are in the realm of symbols, but we're not. We're in the realm of what I like to call instead analogs. Analogs and symbols are two very different things because according to the deeper works, everything that exists here in the physical plane has a root on high, which is its spiritual nature. Now, if the truth is that because all of the, there's not like a lower world and an upper world, there's actually many, many dimensions of worlds. And so I'll give you an example just to, you know, to, to clarify. And I'm taking this from, from a teaching from the Tells of Rav. It's in, it's in a book called the Shuri Das. So in it, the Tells of Rav speaks about how, um, how many planes a concept exists upon aside from its physical plane. And so he talks about, talks about how, how uh, fire, for example. So fire, he talks about the fact that the rationalists and the Kabbalists appear to have a dispute about the nature of Gehenna. Because it says in the, in the, uh, in the Sfarim, in the, in the Holy Works, that Gehenna is a place of fire. And the, and the rationalists, the rationalistic Jewish philosophers said they had ways of explaining what this fire is. And the main way that way they explained it was it's a fire of feeling shame because there's no physicality, right? Once you leave the body behind, the body is left behind. So how does physical fire affect anybody? Like why on earth would Gehenna be of actual fire? We're talking about some other higher meaning of fire or some concept that's ex expressed with the term fire. So, so it sounds like you're talking about it symbolically. Right? They say, well, they mean when it says fire in deeper works. So, what does it mean? According to the rationals, it means uh, it's a kind of symbolic fire, an allegorical fire, which is like this fire of shame. Okay. Now that most people are familiar with this idea. And then, and then we have the Mikubal and we have the Kabbalists, and they say, say, Eish Mamish. They say it's fire, Mamish. Now, do we think that the Kabbalists, that the, that the mystics are so, uh, bogged down by physical concepts that they think that actually physical fire could have any impact whatsoever on a soul. So the tells of, he puts it together in a very powerful way. And he says, the Mikubalim, the mystics are talking about a very deep truth when they call it Eish Manish. That means to say, Eish is Eish. Fire is fire is fire is fire. It just exists on many, many planes. In its lowermost manifestation down here in the physical world, it uh, requires heat and fuel and oxygen in order to be an actual flame. And it has to be fed by heat and fuel and oxygen in order for it to be maintained. And it has certain physical properties and so on. That's called what we call Eish actual fire. And then you move up another layer, right? Another level. And we'll say there's like emotional fire. Well, there's different kinds of emotional fires like fire. Anger is called a fire and, 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 uh, and, and the fire of shame, of feeling embarrassed, also a fire. And, 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 he, and he explains how actually these are not separate things for which we use convenient terms, like we're, we're entering into the realm of semiotics. These are not, these are not different things that we, for which we use convenient terms that are parallel terms just because symbolically it's useful for us. 
but they are actually the same thing existing on different planes. And so when we go to water, right, let's now think about water. You have your buckets, you know, you have your vessels and your actual, you know, like your actual H2O is came out of the faucet, right? And you say, what is the great benefit of the H2O, right? This H2O, which is the same as that H2O or that H2O in terms of its actual physical composition, in what way does it confer something or accomplish something spiritual? Because, because it does. When you see tohorahi, 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 right? In our last session, we ended off with this, of the smaller group doing Mavayabo, or doing the psukim. Tohorahi, tohorahi, tohorahi. It's like this process with just plain water. It's just water that it does something. It accomplishes something, which is not, it's, it's not the tahara of the body because the corpse is, a, the, the body is the body, right? The body confers a uh, ritual impurity. How are you saying tohori, tohori, tohori? Who are you talking about? The body itself, it can't be touched by a coin and not in the building of a coin. And so, so in what way tohori? Oh, tohori, tohori. The neshama that still has some degree of attachment and you're in the process in the, in, while, while doing the tahara, the process of helping the soul of the nifteris to, 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 to cleanly leave its attachment to the body behind and, it, and to be as best possible prepared for its journey into the next world. So that's what you're saying, tohorahi, 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 like a, like a balanit in the mikveh, right? Like the, like, the, like the attendant in the mikveh, she says, kosher, 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 kosher. And just like the balanit says kosher, it says there's a baskol that says kosher on high, right? That she's, uh, she's tahora, she's kshera. So the same thing here, that's in the hands of the, in the mouth, in the hands of the chavah kadisha to, to affect. And then tahorahi, as I mentioned, this is a review for those who were there the other, in the other session, is also elokai nishomashina satavi, Tehorahi, right? Tehorahi. That no matter what this person did in their lifetime, no matter what she went through, no matter where she's been, you're confirming and affirming after having done every single thing the way you were supposed to do it. That Tehorahi, she's back restored to the state of Tahara, which is her original state, which is her untouchable state, which is the state that never gets damaged and cannot be destroyed. You know, this is something that's, um, the, there's a song that, that uh, some people sing in the mornings. Um, because, you know, it, before the davening, before the prayers in the morning, so there's a whole bunch of songs. Some of them are very familiar to people like Adon Olam, and some people even are familiar with the singing of, uh, of Kari Bon in the morning and, um, uh, and so on. But uh, there's a song that's very beautiful called uh, Odell Akel, um, the Morgenstern it's called. It could be you don't know. It's a very, very beautiful song. And it talks about the soul. It's all about the soul. And so one of my favorite lines in the song, even though I love the whole song, is, is Give life to the miskina, to the poor one, the soul, because she comes from this very lofty place, but then she has to deal with all the things in this world. She's yechida, tama unikia. She's unique, the soul, unique, tama, she's perfect, nikia, she's clean. And this is something that for the Chavah Kadisha, you get to be, uh, you get to be involved in restoring and the restoration of the soul on its journey back to the place from which it came, back to its original state of yechida, tama unikia, unique and perfect and clean because nothing, there's not a single thing a person can do through the life of this world that has any impact whatsoever on the purity and the perfection and the holiness of the soul. The soul always is holy. The soul never gets damaged. It can have schmutz on it. So when you're doing all, you're taking your water and you're doing all the things that you need to do to do the preparation of the body, you're actually enacting out the process of cleansing so that the soul is going to return to the place where it originally emerged from, Yechida Tamamakia, in its state of unique, perfect cleanliness, in its cleanness. Okay, now let's talk, so let's talk about water. Water, water is, uh, has many, many different associations in our tradition. 
And some of them sound sometimes even a little contradictory, which we're going to talk about the ways in which sometimes we have, uh, it seems like conflicting, conflicting ideas in water, both positive and negative. Uh, so we'll talk about that too. But um, I'm going down a kind of list, you know, of them. And we'll talk about each one in turn. And I think that uh, we'll be able to see the ways in which it helps to illuminate the process of the Tahara. Now, first of all, the first uh, quality. So we have our physical water, right? Which like, you know, you have, you have uh, water is a dissolver, right? Like, you know, my kids know, my kids always know, like, you know, you have a, they, they get a scrape, right? They scrape themselves up. Like, first things first, did you soak it? Did you soak it? What? Because, because, and, and what's soap? Soap, soap cleanses anything? I remember learning this when I was in chemistry in high school or something, you know, about soap and surfactants and, you know, the way that the way that soap works. I still remember my you know, high school or, or middle school chemistry teacher saying, saying soap doesn't clean anything. Don't you know soap has to be washed off after you're right. <laughs> you don't want to leave that stuff on your body. You want to take it away. You don't leave the soap on. Soap doesn't clean you. What does soap do? It makes water stickier. That's what it does. It's a surfactant. It changes the surface tension in water and it makes it stickier or stretchier so that, that the property of water, it, the water will be better able to grab onto and take away the dirt and the detritus that's on you because it's really not the soap that's cleaning, it's the water. Now, I remember learning this when I was a kid and I thought that's really fascinating because I, you, know, you always think it's the soap that's doing something. It's not the soap. It's the water. Water, water is itself. What? How do we define it? It's like the H2O, the colorless, odorless. Let's hope in clean water, right? The colorless, odorless, tasteless. You know, tasteless, uh, uh, essential element that that every living thing requires to some extent. And um, because you can't have living cells that don't have water. And we are ourselves made up of so much water. And the whole world is made up of so much water. And before there was anything else, there was water. And even this idea of before there was anything else, there was water, right? You go back to the beginning of Breshis. Breshis, Baruch, Kimas HaShemayim, Baruch, Atzat, Baruch, Atzat, Baruch, Atzat, Baruch, Atzat, Before there was anything else, Chazal said there was water. Water, water. And so in the context of mikveh, right? So very often, like for Kala teachers and in the context of, of uh, mikveh tahara, so we talk about this idea of going back to the elemental mikveh amayim, right? Yikavu amayim, mitachat hashamayim, that the waters gather together because it was always the water, the water, the water. Now, this, uh, this idea of going back to the most elemental place, it's not because of the water, it's because the water is an analog for many, many spiritual qualities. So the first of them is, is, is chesed. Is love and kindness. Now, why do we say it has to do with love and kindness? And, and we know that the process of tahara, what are you doing? You're doing the, the chesed shalemis, right? You're doing like the ultimate chesed, the ultimate act of the chesed. So the bringing of the water to the place of the tahara, but what's the, what is really the chesed all about? Chesed, love and kindness, is all about, is all about um, expansion and flourishing. So in order for plants to grow and for things to live, they need water. They have to have water. Now, the thing about um, the the thing about the flourishing, you know, that flourishing quality of the chesed, which is embodied in the water. It's part of the nature of the water because it brings life. We talk about it also. It has to it has to do with the flourishing of life. So, so sometimes water is associated with with like overdoing it, you know, like like too much flourishing. Like taiva, it's also associated with like the, the desires of the body more and more and more. You know, mayim doesn't have a singular, uh, the word mayim doesn't have a singular, doesn't have a singular noun. It's always in a state of plurality, mayim, mayim. And even in its, you know, in itself as a molecule, it's a molecule that sticks to other molecules of water. And that's like, you know, you have your, you have your, um, you have a, a cup, you fill it up to the top, right? Now, you know, if you're very, very gentle when you're pouring into the cup, 
So you can have the level of the water, it can go over the height of the cup. Like there'll be a little bit of a, you can have a little bit of a dome of water and it'll hold itself together. Why? Because the nature of H2O, that the molecules are sticky and that's why it's so cleaning. And that's why you make it stickier in order to make you be able to clean more. But, but the, the molecules themselves, they stick to each other. There's no such thing as a, of a single, uh, there's no such thing as a single, it's always my, but it means expansion, more multiplication. So why do we say it's a negative? Well, it's not really a negative because 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 mayim can mean the flourishing of physicality and materiality because you can't have the flourishing garden where all the fruits are growing and everything is so expansive you can't have that without an abundance of water right so that's called like the the flourishing of the material so the thing about water is that is um this is brought down in um different commentators about avmavinu you know, this week's parsha, yukachna ma'at ma'im, that he said, let there be brought, yukachna ma'at ma'im, a little bit of water for the, for the guests, for the guests, okay. Yukachna ma'at ma'im. And yukachna ma'at ma'im, that's not this week's parsha, next week's parsha. Yukachna ma'at ma'im. So that the little bit of water should be brought. This idea of kicha, that water can be taken, it's brought. That means that by taking it and lifting it, but it gets lifted up. There's also a process of um, to, to draw up water, right? Like from a well. Is that it has, it can have a very base nature, but you can uplift it and then use it for the pr purpose of tahara. That's why I said, where does your water come from that you're using in your tahara? Where is it coming from? Where does it come from? From the faucet. From the faucet, right? So you say it's just water. No, no. You're taking the water, and in taking it, the Shem Yishmol says you lift it, you uplift it from its just watery nature, which could be used for good or for bad, right? The flourishing or, or, or you know, expansion of just material life is not always necessarily beneficial for a person. Maybe it's too much. You know, there's always, say, too much of a good thing. No, but you have the ability to pick it up and it goes back to its higher source. It has a higher source, which we'll talk about. So, so we have, we start off with chesed. You come and you bring the water. These are waters of chesed, of loving kindness. Next, we have uh, the quality of da'at. Now, da'at means to have conscious awareness of Hashem. Conscious awareness, to be conscious of God. How does it have to do with water? Very famous verse in Yeshayahu, right? It says that they will not harm or do any damage on my holy mountain in the ultimate future. Why? Because the world will be filled with knowledge of Hashem. As water covers the bed of the sea, right? Now, so this idea of that, of, of knowledge of Hashem being like water, it's like, this all pervasive environment. Like I remember we were learning um, uh, a lesson in a book of Hasidut I was teaching. And I was like, you know, in the ultimate future, we're all like mermaids, we're like dolphins, we're like whales, you know, like we get to be the, we're, we're, we're mermen, we're, we, we live. It's like, we're, we're swimming in this all pervasive, you know, there's nothing in the environment of everything, our entire environment and atmosphere is only just all pervasive knowledge and awareness of Hashem. Now, when you come to do the Tahara, so the waters of that that you're shedding on the Nifteris, right? You're shedding waters of Das. Is I and I do think we've spoken about this. I don't know if it's in this group or the other group. I get a little confused what I said where. So if it's a review for people, so you forgive me. We say in base measure below that there's no time of doing review of something where you don't get some new insight into it. So hopefully that'll also prove true here if it's something that's familiar. You know, sleep is called small death, right? It says in the Gemara that sleep is the 60th of death. In what ways is sleep a 60th of death? First of all, you see it because every day when you get up in the morning, you have to wash, uh, you wash Nedovaser. You wash your hands in order to remove Ruach Ra, in order to remove this mini spirit of impurity that tends to collect at the end of the fingers, right? The stuff get the end of the fingers. So it's collecting there. And you don't want to infect, you don't want to infect yourself with it, especially not the orifices, right? Those are the apertures, the windows through which 
you're getting sensory impressions into, into yourself and also the orifices of excretion. You have to be careful of elimination excretion. You have to be careful because those are also very sensitive portals. You don't want to infect them with this thing called rah rah, this, this tuma, this impurity, which is tantamount to some kind of mini death, right? So what happened when you went to sleep? You died? No, Chasushon, you didn't die. I mean, your temperature dropped like a degree, half a degree, a degree. And um, if you're a really deep sleeper, people will say you're dead to the world. And, you know, like, but what is it? It's a suspension of conscious awareness. Your brain is going like gangbusters while you're sleeping, right? Like if they attach a person to an EEG, it's not like they're just going through cycles up and down of different types of brain activity. The brain doesn't shut down. Your body's not shut down. You go through different types of, uh, you're doing more cellular repair while you're sleeping. You have all kinds of different things going on. And which is, by the way, every night is like being dead and buried. And then you have a tres mason in the morning. You should know. Everybody goes through a burial. When you go, you go, you go to sleep at night, you're dead and buried. And then you get up in the morning, it's a tria, it's a resurrection. And in the middle of the night, the things that happen to the body that you go through cellular repairs, tikkunim, you have repairs being done, just like the interim period between death and rebirth is the period of repair of the body and the soul. This is every happened to us every single night of our lives. So, so what happens is a suspension of conscious awareness, which means you are not consciously aware of Hashem. That's why when you go to sleep at night, what do we do? The last thing you're supposed to do is to say Kriyat Shema Shalamita, to say the bedtime Shema. Why? It's like closing down the computer. It's like when you close down the computer, you just shut the lid. Like I remember the old days. Nowadays, it doesn't happen. Is the computers are better? I remember if you didn't shut it down and booting, like you had to close it down properly, so then. You could open up the computer the next day and you get the blue screen of death. If anybody remembers the blue screen of death, it's like, you didn't shut me down right. And now I'm not going to do what you want. I'm going to give you big hassles. You're in a rush to work. You could forget it. Now you have to reboot me and reboot me and reboot me. Now, so nowadays the computers hopefully are, are, are a little bit more efficient. But, um, but this is the idea of Krishma Shamita is that when the consciousness, when your conscious awareness of Hashem is going into eclipse, it's going to withdraw because it means higher faculties in the Shema are arising on high when you sleep, just like after death also. They, they rise to be rejuvenated at their source. Just like your body gets rejuvenated, your mind gets rejuvenated, and your soul is receiving a, a reconnection with its source, not distracted by the needs of the body. And so that's why you wake up in the morning, ah, new day, I feel good, right? Hopefully. So, so you're supposed to shut that down um, in a way that you go down with emuna, with a statement of faith, that's the Kriyat Shema Shalomita, to close down properly, because you're going to a state of what's called Yistalkuta Mochim, that of suspension of conscious awareness of Hashem, which is a very dangerous thing to be. Very dangerous thing to be. Just like if you look around and you say, what did Avram Avinu say? Actually, that is in this week's version. He said, they'll kill me in this place because there's no, there's no Yeras Elokim, right? Tell them, you're my sister because there is no fear of God in this place. They'll kill me for your sake. What does it mean? No data lukut, if you're in a place where there's no conscious awareness of Hashem, so then, so then it's, you're in danger. And people will do all kinds of terrible things and can do terrible things. And when you're lying on your bed, so you are physically more vulnerable, right? Because your conscious awareness is not awake with you. Now, when you wake up in the morning, so you use water, right? You use water in order to get rid of this taint that has affected the entirety of the self and it's concentrated in the hands. Why is it focused in the hands? Because the hands, it says in the halacha, the hands are askaniot, they're, they're busybodies. Now the implication in, the, in Jewish law is that you might have touched some place that's not clean, you know, under your arm, scratched some place in the night that, that you'd need to wash your hands before you could say holy words, make a blessing, whatever it is. But the idea of yadayim askaniot means you're, you get tainted by the effect of a nighttime of no consciousness of God. And then it affects your eyes and your ears and everything that's coming into your input and also all the work of your hands. So when you get up in the morning, the first thing you do is you wash your hands. Now, why does washing your hands make a difference? Because you are running the waters of that. I'm going back to that 
beginning stage when there was nothing but nothing but knowledge of Hashem, and that's what will be in the ultimate future. Nothing but nothing, the all-pervasive waters of knowledge of God, I'm reconnecting myself to them as soon as I wake up in the morning. Now, that's true for all of us every day. What does it have to do with the Nishtaris? The Nishtaris is in a state of great, we've spoken about this before, of great vulnerability and exceeding dependence on Shomrin, on the Chavra Kadisha, because the state of the body before burial, after the Nishama has left it for the most part, there's some aspect of Nefesh that still has some attachment, is a state of, of terrible vulnerability to the depredations of what we call negative spiritual forces. What are negative spiritual forces? We can call them maziki, we could call them chitzoni, we could call them shindalids. We've got lots of ways to talk about them. But what does it mean, really? When it comes down to it, it means histalkut amuchim. It means to have no awareness of God in this place. And this we for sure have spoken about. What is the biggest danger that the nifteris is in? That we will look at her and see her only as, only as a corpse, a body, a, a shell. And that's that state of moment. So what do I do? In the Tahara, I'm taking the waters of Das and I'm and I'm flooding, right? You're flooding, you're sh you're, sh you're, sh you're showering, you're shedding this water on the Nifteris. I know that Akarish Brahu is the 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 the, the, the soul that Akarish Brahu, which is a piece of God, inhabited this person. I'm not forgetting it. I'm not allowing it to be forgotten. My awareness is there with it. I'm sharing the Dasa Lapus, even though you say, but but where'd the person go? Where's the soul? No, there's an aspect of Nefesh until the person is buried. And even in most cases, it's still afterwards too, right? It's afterwards too. It's not only it's, it's not only until the burial. So that that the person cannot do for themselves anymore. They're in the deep sleep, right? It's the biggest sleep. It's 60 times the sleep that you go to sleep for every night, right? But who, so who's there? Who's awake? Who's got, who can still hold the water? Who can still be connected to the water? The Chiva Kaddisha. Okay. Now we'll move on to another concept. How are you doing? You're all okay? Okay. Um, can Sweet. I ask a quick question? The water itself represents Das? Yes. But again, it represents many, many things. And again, the representation, I'm a little sensitive about the idea of representation because representing sounds like a symbol. It's analogous to, it has qualities in common with, right? It's a, a lower world manifestation of, or a lower world or a physical analog of, okay? Now, the next, the next concept is one that, um, comes up also in, it's a, it has cross contexts, you know, we're carrying over these ideas from different places and applying them to the place of Chavar Kadisha, of Tahara. But, um, okay, so here's here's another one. This is something that Maral calls Ha'avarat Hatsura, the obliteration of one form and the creation of a new form. So this should be familiar, right? because we have like the waters of the womb and we have the waters of the Mabu, of the flood. And we have, you know, Moshe and Noah, you know, Moshe's, Moshe's uh, time in his Teva, in his box, in, out in the water. So Teva, Teva, Noah and Moshe, they have parallels between them, as Zohar Kodesh tells us. Ark and Ark. Just one's big, big, and one's small, small, but okay. So we have the womb, and we have the ark, and we have Moshe and his water. And then we have that same Moshe that he goes 40 days, right? And another 40 days, and another 40 days that he goes to be obliterated and reborn also. Because we know that the primary time of Yitzirat of Vlad, the Gemara tells us that the primary time of the formation of, a, of new life is during the first 40 days, where during the first 40 days, the sages say, it's it's just like water. That's what it says. After conception for 40 days, the sages say that the fetus is not fully called a fetus yet. They say it's like water. Now, even though they know there's uh, there is a fertilized egg there, but nevertheless, its state of being is in the primary 40 days. And what is the primary, what is 40? What is 40? 40 is mem. What's mem? Mayim, 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 mem, mem. Mem. 
And mum is the primary sound, mum, mum. Mum, 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 mum. Mum is the most primary of all sounds. All babies know mum, 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 mum before they do anything else. In almost all languages all over the world, prime nourishment, primary nourishment, primary association with mother, mama, memory, right, is mm, 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 mem, mem, mem. So the 40, the idea of the Havarat is is this water is a dissolver. And it's a medium in which new something new is able to take root or take a beginning. And it happens at the same time. So Havarat HaTzura and Aleidah Mechadash, right? That something is getting obliterated at the same time it's also coming to be, something new coming to be. For the, for, for the going down into the mikvah, what's the, what's the minimum, minimum dimension of a mikvah? Volume, Min, minimum, not dimension, but volume. 40 seah. 40 seah. So 40 seah mm -hmm. is like, that's called, you know, my personal human space of womb where I get obliterated and where I get to be reborn. So when you're bringing the water to the Nishtaris, right? And you're doing the Tahara for the Nishtaris, there's an aspect of Havarat of obliteration, of a washing away of something, of a, of a mabul coming and destroying, uh, really destroying, dissolving something. And at the same time, something new is happening, just like the whole world went through this obliteration through water, and then it has a new life that comes from it. And Moshe Rabbeinu goes up to, to, to Shemayim, and he's, he's lechem abirim achav ish, right? What, he didn't eat, and he doesn't drink, and he doesn't sleep. Obliterated. A person can do that for 40 days? Obliterated. Obliterated in, like, the heavenly waters of Da'at HaTashem for 40 days, and another 40 days, another 40 days. So this is something also that you bring. This water, which has this power, it's like, the, it seems like, it's not contradictory. It's like, that's just the way it is. You know, it's like when you're, you know, it's like when you're doing, um, who sprouts? Anybody does sprouts at home? Now they like to call them microgreens, sprouts. So, so sprouting, right? So what do you do? First, you soak them. First, you soak them overnight. And it breaks down the kippa, and it gives a signal, a trigger. It's a way of triggering the, the germ plasm inside of the, the, the live part of the seed, which is deep inside of it. It's a way of triggering it into life. But then if you leave it in there, right? You can't leave it in that water. If you leave it in that water more than uh, overnight or may, may maximum 24 hours, what's going to happen? It's masriach. It just starts to dissolve and become, uh, it, it becomes um, uh, putrefies, right? So what do you do then? Do you give up on water? No, if you'll then take them out and then put them on the wet towel, but then you forget to, or in your sprouter, whatever fancy mechanisms we have nowadays. So whatever you do, or the strainer, I don't know. We, we might, I grew up in a house where we were like the, the, the weirdos of, of, of the neighborhood because we were always, you know, alfalfa sprouts and mung bean sprouts growing all over the county. So. So, so then what do you do? If you forget to wet the towel or however you have the setup, or you don't rinse them twice a day and give them water, then what? They're gonna dry up and desiccate. So it's like this balance between the need to make use of the water for Havarat Tzura in order for it to go through its first phase of dissolution, which is necessary for it to be able to come to life. And that's how it is, right? So you have that that you're bringing to the Nifteris of something being washed away and obliterated, which is really the Tahara is the process of restoring the Yechida Tamunakia. Everybody has schmutz that they have to dissolve off of them. All of us have a whole lifetime of things that we need to be released from, that we have all of this, you know, all of this accumulation of muck that has to be removed from us. And that, and that's something that the water, the Rechitza, and then the Tahara, by the time you get that Tahara, you're not getting off actual muck, we're talking about something spiritual, but the, but, but the, uh, but, but it doesn't matter. That's called the Havarat Tzura and the Leidah Mechadash and the preparation for something new. Okay. Shall we? Next? Okay. Next, we'll talk about Tshuva. What does water have to do with Tshuva? So, the, um, I guess it's easiest to see, in a certain way, it's easier to see with, also with the mikveh. Now, there are, I'm, a, I'm like, I'm trying to think how much I can say. <laughs> 
I, I have to think how much time we have and how much I can say. Okay. So let's see. But we'll bring you back, Yudis, for another session if you if you have too no, no, much no, material. No, no, no. I think now. okay. I'm just trying to think, like in explaining it, what can I say and what should I say? Okay, so it's like this. Uh, I guess I don't want to talk to start talking about spheres too much. You know, like everybody will get dizzy and then I'll lose you for the rest of the next 20 minutes. So I have to be careful. So uh, you know, some people are familiar, some people are less familiar. I don't want to make assumptions, but um, okay, I guess I will. We'll go there. Why not? So uh, everyone should be familiar at least with seven spheres, right? Seven spheres, everybody should have familiar uh, with because we count sphere and uh, we count sphere every year. So counting sphere every year, we just had Dush Pizin, right? We just had Sukkis and we had the first day of Chesed, the second day of Vor, and so on, Avram's day, Yitzchak's day, and so on. So we have seven spheres that Jews are familiar with from Chesed down until Malchus, right? Okay, now we're usually thinking of them as going down. Chesed, right, right, left, middle, right, left, middle, and then lowermost. That's the structure. So like right arm, left arm, torso, right thigh, left thigh, genitals, feet. Okay? That's that's the rundown. Chesed, Vura, Tiferis in the middle, Netzah, right, left, Yisod in the middle, and then Malchus, like the feet, two feet on the ground. Okay, so that upright structure, we're usually used to thinking of it in an orderly way from top to bottom. But in actual fact, we also have a way of looking at it from bottom to top, from bottom up. Now, once you climb through this structure from Malchus, Yisod, Hod, Netzach, Tiferes, Gvura, and Chesed, I just went backwards, right? I just, all I did was go backwards. I just went back up the structure. So then what's the next one up? It's Bina. Bina, left-hand side above the floor, Bina. Now, Bina, the world of Bina, the, the, it's a world. We'll call it a world. It's a realm. So this realm of Bina, which Bina means, um, I don't know, we usually call it understanding. So, bye, Ellen. It was good to have you for as long as we had you. So the... Um, so Bina, up there in the left-hand side above Gvur. So Bina is great, right? It's, it's great. Everyone needs to have Bina. Like women get extra Bina. It says in the Gemara, Bina Yaserin, Mother Nashim, that extra women have an extra measure of Bina. Bina doesn't mean intuition. People like to translate that as intuition. Bina does not mean intuition. The better translation for, it, for Bina is discernment. Discernment. It also means to be able to make inductions and deductions, to understand one thing from another, but it means discernment, to be able to tell one thing from another. Now, Bina is considered to be, of all of the spheres, of all of these qualities, Bina is considered to be the home base of Teshuvah. Why? Why is it the home base of Teshuvah? Because you can't figure out your own life unless you apply the quality of discernment to be able to figure out what needs to be fixed. You see, to be able to do teshuva, to do a proper teshuva, to be able to do real repair, I have to be able to like be a good diagnostician of my own conditions and see what's going on with me. What's going on in my life? What's going on in my relationships? Where am I going wrong? And then I have to be able to apply my bina, which is my quality of discernment. Okay, it's all right, doesn't matter. To be able to pick out and, and discern what needs correction. You know, in doing tshuva, we just feel like pass through the season of tshuva, right? How easy is it to figure out, let's say in our relationship with other people, how easy is it to figure out like exactly who did wrong here and what exactly was the wrong that was done here and exactly how is it supposed to be repaired and what am I supposed to do here in order to repair it and who needs to do what? Like that requires the steady, strong application of bina. What does it have to do with water? So we say water, there's upper waters and there's lower waters. Right? Upper waters, lower waters. So the water of um, the, the water, the cleansing water, Bina is called many things, but one of the things it's called is a Nahar Shemitahir Mikulaktami. It's called a river 
that cleanses from every stain. Now, so, so let's say you have your water, right? That you're bringing to the Nishteris. And we say, these are waters of Teshuvah. That water that's going to clear away and cleanse away and, but why does it clear away and cleanse away? Because actually the mochin quality, the, the spiritual mind quality that's really embodied in the water is discernment, is to be able to separate one thing from another. Think about like um, even something as simple as you have two things that are stuck together, right? So what do you do? I mentioned it before, like my child gets a scrape, but I know they're schmutzing it. What do I do? I say, hey, soak it. Soak it, put it in water. And then the, the, uh, the, they'll, they'll separate. If I have, uh, if I have um, you know, something that's adhering, you probably have a bandage on you. And you need to you need to pull it off, and you don't want to rip out your arm hair when you pull off the bandage. What do you do? You soak it, right? You soften it, you soak it, and then there'll be a separation. So bina is this is like the essential chuba ingredient, but it's cold water because it affects discernment because I can't do chuba without it. So when when you're bringing the water to the nifteris, it's also your your part. Like I just I think it's such a wondrous thing that that it's possible for one Jew to do, or a group of Jews to do for another in a, by way of the analog, the physical analog, by doing this process of, of following the customs of the Tahara and saying the psukim as they're given to us and so on, and having good intentions that you're doing, you're doing an actual something for the person who is in your hands, that you're helping them in their path. We have true, but listen, as soon, during the, during this, in this world, it's, not easy always to do Teshuvah. Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, he, he had a very good sense of humor. So he, um, he, said, he said once to his students, he said, everybody thinks it's so difficult to do uh, what he called tikunim, tikunei aniftarim, to do, uh, you know, to fix the souls of people who have already passed on, that they should have an easier time in the next world. He said, that's easy, nothing hard about that. It's dealing with people who are alive that it's hard. Bali Bahira, people who can still make choices and who don't see things so clearly. They're hard to deal with. You guys are hard to deal with. But but the dead? No, as soon as a person leaves the body, so already everything is very, very clear. It's like you just apply some water and help them do their chuva. Just pour it on them, and everything is gonna come clear. They're already in the place where all of the nonsense of this world is already, they're finished with it. And even people are a zoche, that before they leave this world, already they're finished with the nonsense of this world. If a person had warning ahead of time and they were ill ahead of time and they had time to collect themselves ahead of time, then you can see the process. If you, if anybody has ever been through a person through the last stages of their life. So it's like, what a revelation it is to say a person, to watch a person say the things that they held on to their whole life long, they adhered so strongly to, right? And it's gotta be this way and it has to be that way. And it's only like this. And again, this is something I, I must take care of. And then all of a sudden it's like the hard holding, it, they let, they to let go of it. And that's what, you know, we say, how are babies born? Kaha, how do people leave this world? Kaha, right? You come into this world, you want to grab everything. You leave this world, it's like, what on earth? What on earth do I need this for? I'm finished, finished with it. So if a person is oche, already their waters of bina are flowing over them before they leave this world. And if they haven't been zoche, the Chaver Kadisha comes along with the waters of Tahara and helps the process along. But they're already like, they're already most of the way there because they already went through the process of death and they've already separated from the body. Yes. Moya Telta asked about Chibuta Kever. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, it, especially the practice of putting the earth. The earth is a big, is a, a very important piece of it. Let's see. Um, okay. The fifth. Life. There is 10 things, in the, it says in the Medrash that there are 10 things that Chazal called oh, alive. Sure. Um, what you said is so beautiful and I'm not in any way trying to, you know, <laughs> eliminate it, but what about when you read when Yochanan and Zakkai and other great um, sages, the Hachamim were asked by their students, 
you know, what is this? This is Mahim Torim. I will sprinkle clean water on you. You'll be cleansed. You know, we use it all as Zarachti Mahim Torim. And he said, it's not the waters of the mikvah that cleans it. It's not anything else that cleans it. It's HaKadosh Baruch Hu who cleanses us. Now, I mean, how, I mean, I understand what you're saying, but how would you explain this to somebody who might bring that up? You know, what is this hocus pocus? The, hefech, the whole idea is that, the whole idea that have, is that it is the power of tshuva that does it. It is the power of the chesed elion that does it. it is the, the water is just the analog. The water is mm. just a physical analog of this. It's not the water, obviously. I keep I said this already several times. Now, you've Where's explained it. Where's the water from? You've explained it beautifully, but not everybody's exposed to this, and not all of us can translate what you're saying. And if Look, they pick up on that sort of a thing, you know, what are you talking about? This water, and I'm not going, I don't want to waste your time, but um, no, 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 it's a good question. I don't mean to dismiss it. First no, of all, no. in terms of what you can share with somebody else, the reason why we do a class like this is that whatever resonates most strongly with you that you can have in mind when you're doing the tahara so that's good it's all to the better like the Baal, like the like the author of the mavaya book tells us the more that you have in mind the better it is for the person that you're doing tahara for in terms of explaining it or sharing it that which you feel rebellion mayor blocks used to say as follows if you can't explain it then you don't understand it right yeah so, mm. so if it's something to which I'm, I feel I, I, uh, that it resonates with me and I'm able to process it through my mind and I feel connected with it, that's going to be something I'm going to be able to share. And if I find that it sounds like it's in the Louvre, it's like disconnected from me, too lofty, or it doesn't speak to me, so it's okay. It could be that it's not the thing to talk to somebody else about. Because I'm, I'm throwing on you a lot of different ideas. Thank okay. you. Now, that passage, the Zarakti Alechem Mayim Tehorim, so that we did, we learned the Gemara, right, the other day, in the in the other group, we did that Gemara. It's mm Yuma. -hmm. Maybe I'll pull together a group of us, we can uh, talk amongst ourselves and come back to you with questions. <laughs> also, I think, but really I think you can idea. maybe, uh, if people want to be able to see uh, what it is that we did, maybe there were recordings oh, or something like that, I don't know. Absolutely. Okay, so let's talk now about life itself. There are 10 things that the sages call life. One of them is water, right? As it says in the Pasuk in Zechariah, so what does it mean water is life? Well, I mentioned already at the beginning, right? That life flourishes because of the presence of water. Uh, but, but in the Yalkut Ruven, it says something very interesting. It says, no, the place where the water is, where the life is, it's called the Shekhinah is there. It's the force of life that's there. And that's why, Lachen yesh lakol tahara b'mayim. That's why we use, that's what Yalkut Ruven says. That's why we use water for tahara, because we are bringing life to the place where there's death. Because we're bringing, we spoke about this, I think, right, about Adam, I don't remember which group it is, but like the, you're, you're, you're the living Hever Kadisha, you're coming to do the Chesed Shal Emes, you're coming to the place where there's a, where there's a deficit of life, and you're bringing the force of life of doing, of the living Hever Kadisha coming to do this act of a mitzvah for the sake of the Nifteras, and this is called the place of Tahara because it's the place where life is being infused, life, just water as life. And water is, of course, compared to Torah. So a person leaves this world, you know, why is a nifter called a nifter? It's a turi mina mitzvot, right? Because the nifter is no longer obligated in mitzvot. Potter, potter give one. Finished. But you have practices to do, meaning it's it's quite, a, what's quite amazing is that the nifter is niftar, right? The person who passed away is gone. They have nothing to do anymore with mitzvah. And now we have loads of mitzvah that we have to do. And in the time when we were careful about ritual impurity, so then how many mitzvot have to do with all, all of the things that have to do with Tumat Tahara, right? So it's like they left, they left, they're gone. They no longer have mitzvot to give, but they left behind this world of, they didn't leave the world of Torah. It says, that, that um, it's in Mishle. I can't remember the Pasuk, right? It says like even when you're, when you're awake, when you're sleeping. So the sages said, the Torah goes you when, when you're awake, when you're alive, when you're sleeping, when you're dead. What does it mean 
the Torah goes with you when you're dead. You're not fulfilling mitzvot anymore. Mifter, finish, no more mitzvot. No, because the Torah is a part of everybody's life also in the tipul of the miftah. Uh, also in the way, you never, you're never you never disassociated from the Torah. You bring the water to the nifter and you're like, you haven't left the Torah. You haven't left the Torah. You're still connected to the Torah. We have halachot to fulfill with you. We have obligations towards you. We, you haven't left the, the embrace of the world of the Torah. Because you don't. Nobody ever leaves the embrace of the Torah. That's also part of the water that you bring. It's also the, embodied in the water that you bring. Because it may seem you have an ifa. What, what do they have to do with mitzvot and with turning anymore? No, they still do. Of course they do. There's no such thing as a Jewish soul until the until the tria, right? Ever and forever, the Jewish soul has what to do with the Torah. So when you bring your water, you bring your water, you're, again, reaffirming. You didn't need the Torah. Meshach becha, uvekumecha. Torah is going to be with you in your lying down, which means after your death, and also when you're resurrected. You're never, never, you're never gone from it. Okay, and the last thing that I want to talk about is this idea of um, uh, what I would call of um, of uh, like a unification. Or are things coming together, being unified. So I'm gonna I'm gonna read out loud a quote from a book called Shemi Shmuel from the Socha Chaber Gaon, because I love his language, and I'll translate it and then I'll explain. But Tam Sheino Ba Elim Nishon Rabbi, the fact that the word for water always comes in the language of plurality, Mayim, right? There's no there's no singular water. There's always Mayim. I spoke about it a little before. Yesh Lomar. It's because they include everything within them. Now here he brings in a Kabbalistic idea. He says that the root of water on high in the upper worlds is in the realm of Bina, which I mentioned earlier. And Bina, remember, where is Bina sitting? Start from Malchus, Yisod, Hod, Netzach, Tiferes, Vura, Chesed, and then above, Bina. So Bina is the place where, from which, there's all this, the beginning of all this diversification of all these different qualities. Now, if it started in there, it means that they're all included in there. What is that? What do I mean by that? Because all of these qualities are unfolding. They are unfolding. It's like it's like a structure that is unfolding and articulating itself as it descends. But it's not mechadesh anything. It's not new things happening. Bina is called mother, mommy. Ima, that's its other name. Bina, Ima. So you say the baby that's born afterwards, where was it? It was encompassed in mommy, right? It was encompassed first in Ima. And then the baby was born. And then it started to, it, it, it breathed on itself. And then it started to creep around. And then it started to talk. And then it was walking around. And then it went to school. Then it became a doctor. And then it had children of its own. And then grandchildren and all these other things that happened. Where did, where were they? All of those stuff, we had all of that ramification outward and all of that diversification. Where was it? It was in Ima. It was all held in Ima like a seed inside of, you know, the acorn, right? Inside of the acorn, it's like in there, and then it's another tree, and more and more of them. So all held in there. So in that place, all of the diversification that's going to happen afterwards, there, it's all unified. Now, if you look at it, what do you see? Just one thing. You look at Bina, what do you see? One thing, right? But what is it really? Multiplicity, multiplicity that's just waiting to happen. Multiplicity that's waiting to happen. So Mayim is this language of, Multiplicity is always rabbin. Okay. And, and this is a powerful, it's a very powerful idea. He says, that's why water is without a color. And that's why you put water, you take the same water. And if you 
water an aloe vera or you water the grapes or you water the roses or you it's the same water meaning it's just the same material the same essential material because it has within it the essence of the growth property the sikalu property and it can be the feeder it's the feeder of all of these different types of life. You don't need a specific type of water for this specific plant. Why? Because all you need is the water because within the water is everything that it requires. Maybe it needs also nutrients, let's say, but, but that's gonna be specific to the soil, but the water itself, right? That water answers to such a wide variety of needs because it's like Bina, which has within it all of its multiplicity, just carrying it very small. So our mind is like answers to all these needs. And that's why he says, it's, it doesn't have any color. If you put it in a blue cup, how does the color, what does the water look like? It looks blue. If you put it in a green cup, it looks green. If you put it in a white cup, it looks white. Why? Because it doesn't have anything of its own. It has the capacity to be able to be anything. And that's coming from the water. Now, okay. So because the root of water is so very, very lofty, it is so very, very all-inclusive. So when you're bringing water, the water as part of the Tahara, it means I'm going back to this most essential, essential of all elements, the beginning of all beginnings, where everything, where everything can be addressed, just like chuva can address everything, because I'm going to the place, I'm going high enough where there's nothing outside of its purview. Like I've gone back to the most essential of all elements. There's no place else to go. And what and, and so this is the this is what I could use. Because you say, why not why not wash the body down in sand? Can you not clean a body with sand? Of course you can. You can use an abrasive. Why do you have to use water? I mean, it's not like there's no other materials in the world. It, it's not because it can't be done some other way, right? So it means specifically mind, specifically water, because water takes us back to the place that's so lofty, so much a beginning, so primary, that it covers all the basis of all of the multiplicity of this person's life that needs to be addressed and cleansed. And I think it's eight o'clock. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow, there's a lot. <laughs> Water. Amazing. I said water. I said we'll do water for an hour. It's like easy it's to talk amazing. about. Amazing. So I'm so excited. I'm really excited to write up the notes and all the things that we missed because we're thinking about this and then we've got another idea. And uh, oh, yeah, I, I, I tend to like pile it on, but I figure you'll process it out later. It's okay. Yep, for sure, for sure. So thank you, 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 thank you. And um, you know, to be continued. Um, just a quick housekeeping is that in two weeks uh, we have a panel Irene from England and Nadia from South Africa and Robin from Arizona are going to speak a little bit about how Hebra Kadisha has changed their lives so please support them and come and be part of that gathering trying to connect us all and be a community of women who are very passionate about Hebra Kadisha and and again the 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 the, the good goal is for us to elevate our practice. And uh, Yudas, you are uh, so instrumental in uh, bringing us this material and bringing us to a different level of Kavana for sure. I speak for myself and hopefully for other people that um, every time I do a Tahara now after learning and thinking and processing, um, it has changed how I perceive what I do, doing the same thing, but feeling very differently about how I do what I do. And, and it's and, very, uh, very, I can't tell you how gratifying it is to be a part of what you're doing in whatever capacity I can be a part of it. I, 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 I only wish that I would be able to do it in practice, but um, this was not my, apparently not my lot in life yet. And, uh, but to have any chalik in it is very, very important to me. And I appreciate very much that you brought me along. Good, anybody else want to, Last minute comments before we all sign off. Anybody want to <laughs> add their voice? By the way, yeah. everything that I said also applies if you're talking to Kalas and you're talking to, you, know, you take the same ideas and you adapt them also to talking about mikveh because the, all these ideas have to do with mikveh as well. Yeah. Right. Well, when I when I work with Kalas, I tell them, you know, you take your, well, however many tefillas you do when you do your last one, stay under a little bit longer and let the water obliterate you. Like just, because if you stay down there, you would not be able to, you wouldn't be able to live. So when you come up, you say, ah, Xavier, I might want the king. I am getting up like, like a baby just out of the womb, right? Bursting out of the, bursting out of the amniotic fluid. 
please, please feel free to unmute yourself to just uh, say hello, goodbye, thank you, whatever you like I'm to having, share. Having Thank, thank you, you for the time. Thank you for the for the participation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to say ditto. Absolutely. Now that thank I've heard you, when I go to to do a tara, different frame of mind. Lachayim, <laughs> lamayim. Thank you so much, Judas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.